not to misrepresent our information. The first is coordinate precision, the second is accuracy, and the third is uncertainty. And I'll try to distinguish each of those from each other. So, here is a slide showing a couple of those concepts. One is a named place. So it's a place of reference in a locality description. In the example of five miles north of Davis, it's Davis. And here is the, the diagram or this, uh, the graphic from the previous presentation showing that the center of Davis is here. There's a radius here. The named place is Davis. The linear extent is the distance from the center of that place to the farthest point that's inside of that place. In the definition specifically, it says the furthest point of the aerial extent. And the definition of aerial extent is there. So the ex aerial extent is the shape, the area that, occupy, that the location occupies. Our linear extent is the distance from the center of that shape to the point farthest on that shape that's still inside. So from the center here to a corner there is the linear extent. The next two concepts are offset and heading. In this example, five miles northeast of Beatty is the five miles that is the offset. And it is the northeast that is the heading. So here's a depiction of five miles northeast of Beatty. Beatty is here. That arrow points northeast and it's five miles long. There's another way to interpret a, such a description and that is to follow a known route. This other red line here follows a road and that run follows the road it basically in the northeast direction but it goes on the road for five miles. So there are two possible interpretations there. The original description didn't tell us to go by road, but if this happened to be a herpetological specimen, herpetologists only take their coordinates by road if they have a road. Usually they find things on the road. They don't like to walk away from roads. Away from roads means you have to carry the beer, and that gets difficult. So there might be rules that is to say, there might be rules for a particular discipline. Don't carry your beer too far from the road, and therefore, write your descriptions by road. Coordinate precision is the first of those three complicated terms that I put at the end of my list. This one is the specific decimal representation of the precision of the coordinates. And the examples are the best way to show that. So if I have a coordinate precision of one, that means that the precision is to the nearest degree. If it's 0.1, it's to the nearest tenth of a degree. And then if I use minutes or seconds, then it's some strange number that's based on dividing degrees by 60 or 3,600. Does that make sense? So higher precision means a smaller number here. That's as opposed to accuracy, which is a measure of in something entirely different. Even though in English, we often interchange the word precision and accuracy, they're entirely different concepts. Accuracy is a measure of how close to true something is. And just because you use more decimals doesn't mean it's more true. It just means it's more specific. And often these things are confused in measurements. But they're distinct. To put this graphically, here I have the precision versus accuracy target. So the target center is true. Take it to be true. Whatever's at the center is truth. And these representations that are other circles are attempts to arrive at the truth. So in this case, the most precise of those attempts is the smallest circle, which is this one. That circle has the highest precision. It's right there. 
And the big one has the lowest precision. It's somewhere in there. Make sense? But they're not the same when it comes to accuracy. Accuracy is the one that's closest to true. And the most specific one is far from the truth. All of these are farther to the, from the truth than the least precise one. Because the least precise one actually touches on the truth. Right? Some part of this is true. No parts of any of those are actually true. I hope that's clear. So some notes with respect to precision and accuracy. This is basically methodology, things you should keep in mind and that you should do. The first is, when you record coordinates, keep as many decimal places of precision as you can. When you take it from a GPS, keep all those digits. If you don't, your circle's getting bigger. You're getting less specific. Keep it all. It's information that you're otherwise going to lose. Specifically, keep at least seven digits of position when in decimal degrees. Now, if you quickly do the calculation in your head, I don't think you can, but if you were able to quickly do the calculation in your head to say how big is seven digits in meters, it's less than a centimeter. So you say, John, why are you bothering me with seven digits of precision? I don't know, I don't care where everything is down to less than a centimeter. It's not for that reason. The reason is, if we keep all seven digits and we change our coordinate system, we can reverse the process and get back to where we started. If you keep less, the point will migrate away from where it started. If you do coordinates, the example would be, suppose I have decimal degrees and I want to turn it into degrees, minutes, seconds. I turn it into degrees, minutes, seconds. If I don't keep seven digits, when I turn it back into decimal degrees, it will be in a different place. Simple as that. So, a lot of people try, want to think, okay, we're trying to represent how specific it is. No, it's a different thing. That's why we have a coordinate uncertainty in meters. That tells us how specific it is. That tells us how big the circle is. Precision does not. If you give decimal degrees to five decimal places, even that is more specific, or more precise than having degrees, minutes, and seconds alone. If you go with degrees to six decimal places, you actually get to degrees, minutes, and hundreds of seconds. So keep in mind that how precise or how specific coordinates can be and how many decimals to keep. So if you have your GPS and it happens to be in degrees, minutes, seconds, and you have the point zero one in the seconds, keep those. Keep those. False precision happens when data are converted from degrees, minutes, and seconds to decimal degrees. Why is that? If I have a number in degrees, minutes, and seconds, and the, number, the seconds is an integer, like five, and I convert that entire thing into a decimal degree, and I keep as many digits as possible, such as seven, now I have seven digits of precision in the decimal degrees, but that is not the precision of the original. Another reason why we don't use the measure itself to tell us anything about precision. We need another value, the coordinate uncertainty in meters, because there's this problem of false precision when it's translated. Finally, a GPS will faithfully give you a point. But it will not faithfully record, if you download it, it will not record the accuracy. Accuracy, in this case, is what we mean. It's not precision, it's accuracy. It's how close to the truth is that GPS recording. For example, if I take the GPS, I stand here, I take my recording, 
and I walk away. I give that reading to somebody else with another GPS, and I say, go there. And I take the GPS, and they come back, and they end up over here. It's not there. It's not true. It's because the GPS can be only so accurate. Sure, it can give you seven decimal points. It can be very precise, but it can only be so accurate as the conditions at the time. And the GPS won't record that for you. It will tell you when you look at it, but it won't record it for you. So you need to record that. When is that important? It's important especially under conditions where the GPS signal can bounce in forests, in canyons, or in cities. If you do an experiment and take a GPS into different environments and try to recreate the location over time, different days, different conditions, you'll find out that in forests, in towns, or in canyons, that you can't get as close as you could out in an open field. And it's because of the way the GPS works, it's getting signals from different satellites. And those signals are coming to the device in your hand. But in a forest or in a town, those signals have to bounce around to get to you. If they bounce around, it's telling the GPS that the signal had to go further than it really did. And so it thinks you're somewhere else. So the point here is that that's information that you will lose if you don't record it from the GPS at the time. So do that. Question? Okay. Okay, so in this case, how, what do you do to make the point to be more, more accurate? What can you do? Yeah, what can you do? Okay, if you really want it to be as accurate as possible, there are a couple of things you can do. One, you can invest in a very expensive system. Expensive GPS? Expensive GPS. Okay. The way you do that okay. is that you have a base station, a GPS base station, one that your GPS talks to, in a very well-known location. Mm -hmm. So first you have to have that. Yeah. A very well-known location and a transmitter from that location. And your GPS has to be able to talk to it. And then the GPS will do something called differential GPS, mm -hmm. which is to say where you are with relation to the very well-known base station. And that allows you to get very, very detailed. So, for example, ships, when they come into harbors, mm -hmm. they use GPS to navigate. It's because they have that added information that tells them quite well exactly where they are to less than a meter, which you'll never get ever with a GPS handheld. In that case, your best scenario is that the GPS will tell you four meters of accuracy. Mm -hmm. But even though the GPS is telling you that, the reality is that that is based on an algorithm, not on a measurement. And so the, the real value is actually even bigger than that. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. The other way is to, to use a system to define a base point, for example, in a grid, and define that very well. Make sure that's very well known and then build your grid system by measuring on the ground. And then you take your coordinates on your grid rather than with the GPS. And from the grid, you translate to decimal latitudes and longitudes by the distance from the origin. Mm -hmm. So suppose you, you know your latitude and longitude of your corner of your grid extremely well to within one meter, mm -hmm. and the latitude is zero, zero. And your grid system is one by one, one kilometer by one kilometer. So now you'll measure from your origin at zero, zero in meters east and north. Mm -hmm. 
Now, to get decimal latitude and longitude, you translate those meters east and north based on the model of the Earth and the origin to get back to decimal degrees without the, un the inaccuracy of a GPS. Basically, both methods require you to make a determination of one point of reference closer to you that is extremely accurate. So are there, uh, are there uh, a GPS without uh, a margin of error? No, they don't exist. They, they don't, don't exist. exist. No, a GPS without a margin of error does not exist. Okay. All of them do. Differential GPS it makes use of this other technology is the best possible to get you as accurate as possible. Um, interestingly, under normal conditions, without buildings, without forests, without things for the signal to bounce around on, we generally get something like 10 meter accuracies from GPSs. So not too bad. But if you need to be more accurate, for example, on a very detailed plot, you can't do that. You can't use it. Uh, another thing is that there was a time in the past when the GPS signals were purposely made less accurate. This is before May first of the year 2000, I believe, in which our President Clinton said, we won't do that anymore. We're not going to make it, make all this technology bad. And they took that away. Before, there was a signal put into it that made the accuracies less than 100 meters on purpose. 